Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Nuts and Bolts Digital Inking. My name is Neil Bridot. My pronouns are he, him, his. I run Radiator Comics, which distributes self-published and small press comic books, graphic novels, uh, and zines. We also, um, we also uh, publish some comics, including Whit Taylor's series Fizzle, which we're very proud was nominated for an outstanding series Ignatz Award recently. And you have about like four hours to vote uh, on that. So if you haven't put in your, your ballots yet. Um, so uh, this program is made possible with support from the uh, John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. We're grateful for their support as well as the support of Oolite Arts and the Miami Foundation. We start every event with a land acknowledgement. Um, South Florida has a long history of stolen land and stolen labor. Um, that's not ancient history and uh, the effects of which are still felt today. Um, it's important to acknowledge the indigenous people who have, and, uh, who have been and continue to be caretakers of the land on which we live and work. Um, in South Florida, we live on Miccosukee and Seminole land. The Tequesta lived here for thousands of years and were caretakers as well. Um, it's also important to acknowledge the labor and involvement of African American, Haitian, Bahamian, and other Caribbean people in the development of South Florida. Uh, South Florida's history of stolen land and stolen labor is not unique, and organizations all over the Americas start their events with land acknowledgments. So no matter where you're tuning in from, I invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which you live and, and work in the indigenous people who are the caretakers of that land, um, as well as the history of the land and the violence perpetrated by European expansionism and white supremacy. So if we want to take a moment just to reflect on that. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's event is part of Radiator Comics Studio, which is a series of programs and publications to highlight and support the South Florida cartooning community and connect it with a larger national scene. Um, today we're continuing our Nuts and Bolts series in which cartoonists who have a connection to South Florida talk about their practical approaches to one specific aspect of making comics. So this is a chance for people who are just starting out uh, learning uh, to, um, you know, gain information from people who are practicing artists. Um, it's also a great way for peers to exchange ideas. Um, so uh, tonight's installment is about digital inking. So we're talking about using computers to make the final artwork of one's comics and illustrations. And we're joined tonight um, by Diego A. Infante, uh, Mar Julia Isai Oviedo, and Karina Vo. Um, they'll each be giving a 10 minute presentation on their own inking techniques and then we'll open up the floor uh, to conversation between them and questions from you. Um, now seems also like a really good time to remind folks that next month is Inktober, during which cartoonists and illustrators and all sorts of artists uh, make, uh, take up the challenge to ink a drawing every day of the month. Um, and this challenge was created by illustrator and cartoonist Jake Parker but you can really make it your own exercise. Um, every year, a list of prompt of like 31 prompts gets posted on social media. So you can follow that hashtag of Inktober. Um, but some people use it as a challenge to make a 31 page comic in a month. Others do standalone drawings. Um, whether you're a professional artist or a doodler, um, you should consider taking up Inktober. So yeah, it's a, it's a fun, fun activity. Um, so I'm going to present the, or I'm going to introduce the presenters, and then I'm going to hand it over to them, and uh, we'll get started with the presentations. So our first presenter tonight will be Isai Oviedo. Isai is a freelance illustrator and designer based in Miami, Florida, drawing influences from video games, uh, Western animation, and anime. Isai takes uh, seeks to bring a user-friendly, approachable nature to his comics and tabletop game designs. So welcome, Isai. Uh, following Isai will be Mar Julia. Um, Mar is an Ignatz Award nominated cartoonist and illustrator from Palm Beach County, Florida, who currently lives in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, their personal work focuses on magical realism, close personal interactions, and the ways in which we often misunderstand each other. 
Currently, they're working on their first graphic novel in collaboration with Samuel Tier, which is coming out from Versify in 2022. Uh, so welcome, Mar. Um, following Mar will be Karina Vo. Uh, Karina is a Miami-based illustrator with a deep love for comics, cartoons, and anime. While she most, uh, mostly creates standalone illustrations, she contributed Mango City to the Sun and Sand comic anthology, co-published by Radiator Comics and uh, Black Jose Press. Um, and Karina also occasionally creates single panel comics. Uh, through her work, she addresses her own interactions with the world and mental health through creating characters in semi-surrealist situations. And our final presenter tonight will be um, Diego A. Infante. Diego is a cartoonist and visual artist from Venezuela. He grew up in Miami and has been drawing and painting cartoon characters since he learned how to hold a pencil. In 2016, he self-published his first comic, Children of Argus, uh, through eight-sided comics. Since then, he's self-published several titles, including uh, his first graphic novel, Scorpia and the Smiling Freaks, and is currently working on a reboot series of that first comic, The Children of Argus, and a new graphic novel titled Los Pasados. So welcome to, to Diego. Uh, welcome to everybody else. Um, I totally forgot to... Um, show you these slides that I created for the uh, presentation. So here are some examples of folks' works. Here's Isai's work. Um, I'm sure they will also be showing you their work when, when they are presenting, but here's uh, Mar Julia's work. This is uh, Yellow, Yellow, Yellow is the, the Ignatz nominated mini comic. Um, Karina's work and Diego's work. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Isai. All right, perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, as, as Neil uh, stated, uh, my name is Isai Oviedo, and I am a artist based here in Miami, Florida. Uh, let me know if you guys can, can you guys see the screen, by the way? Just, I'm just double checking to see if I'm screen share. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, one second. Coming through. Sure. Just double checking. Okay, perfect. I think we should be all right. Yes. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. So yeah, so as I mentioned, my name is Isaiah Oviedo. I'm, I'm an artist here in Miami, Florida. Uh, born and raised here all my life. Basically lived in a 10 block span here in, in uh, Little Havana. Um, I'm Honduran, but uh, I feel more Cuban because of the people that are in the area. But uh, yeah, but but just being in this area definitely has been interesting because I uh, I get introduced to a lot of different cultures in Miami, and uh, that'll show in my work as as well. That it's just kind of like it's an amalgamation of a lot of different styles, especially Western and Eastern, and just kind of the way that I I tend to think about art. But uh, so I've done some things related to uh, so a, a lot of animation, a lot of uh, storyboarding. And then a little bit of game design and uh, working on game studios, doing level design and things like that. So I, I've done a little bit of everything, but uh, today I want to talk about, you know, the, the kind of process that I've been doing lately. It's a big project that I've been doing working on a comic or a couple comics. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about that. So it's called, <laughs> the name of my presentation is Between the Lines, a tell-all memoir about how I learned to love the line. I just had to come up with a name. But um, so first and foremost, I'm going to talk about influences. Uh, influences wise, uh, one of the biggest things that I take from is uh, from manga. Uh, so I talk about uh, Osama Tezuka, who is the godfather of, of anime and also the father of, of manga as well. And so he's worked on things as well. He's the creator of Astro Boy, so you know that. Uh, Metropolis and uh, Kimbo the White Lion. Wait, that's, that's not Kimbo the White Lion. That, that, Still, still not Kimbo the White Lion. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Okay, so actually it's interesting. The reason I did that is because uh, there's a little bit of debate about, uh, about plagiarism, actually, which is very interesting that a lot of people suspect that uh, Disney stole the idea of, uh, it's alleged, of course, I'm not making anything clear, but, but so, so just so first and foremost, you can tell that uh, this is a very influential art style, a very influential person, and, and his comics uh, have a huge impact, you know, so so he's done a lot of stuff you know, for Astro Boy. Astro Boy is uh, some of the things that I take from the style of simple, 
character designs, more expression. Sometimes the proportions are a little bit, uh, you know, kind of not, not super realistic, but they're more expressionate, but the worlds themselves can still be kind of more detailed and defined, you know, like the bugs are still pretty realistic. The, the backgrounds are, are sometimes, you know, a little minimalistic, but, but a lot of the architecture and, and like this, the, the, you know, the, 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 um, yeah, the architecture of things are, are very much, uh, you know, grounded in reality. Uh, you know, he does a lot of, uh, this is also from a different comic that he's done, which is called uh, Princess Knight. And uh, so the, the character designs themselves are simple, but there's usually a lot of visual flourishes around the designs. And that gives them a little bit more space to, to kind of be creative with the, 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 like the tiny little elements of design. So uh, the second influence that comes from him is actually is a, is a protege of, of uh, Osama Tezuka, which is Shotaro Ishinomura. Uh, he is the creator of a uh, manga called Cyborg 009, and then also another one called Common Rider. Uh, so the, the one that's Common Rider is actually interesting because uh, he has essentially created the, the Sentai uh, genre in general, which is Power Rangers. So uh, there was a lot of different variations. He created the first um, superheroes, uh, the first Japanese superhero, Skull Man. And uh, a lot of his influence, a lot of his stuff as well has been super influential to me and I think to a lot of people. Uh, he's worked on, you know, comics for, for Zelda that showed up in the Nintendo Power magazine for like three, four years. Um, he's, you know, like I said, the, the, the comic Cyborg 009. Um, and ultimately, he's actually, he actually holds the world record for the most, um, the most uh, uh, pages of a comic, the most comic pages drawn of any human being. Uh, so very, very influential, uh, these two artists in particular. I take a lot of influence from them, but, and there's so many more people I could talk about, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on them because they're some of my major influences. Uh, so now getting into the more technical side of things, line work. So uh, a couple of things that I do, I'm going to be uh, drawing examples mostly from uh, the first two issues of the comics that I'm working on. The first one is out already. You can even read it if you want on my website. And the second one, I'm, I'm working on it, and it's soon going to be released. But uh, so the first example of, of things that I do when it comes to line work is conveying motion. Uh, what I do usually for, for this is that I will draw an entire, you know, I'll draw the scene normal as it should be. Uh, but when I want to add motion, I might just, you know, erase little gaps and then kind of draw lines to, of course, you know, express like the direction of where they're going to go. You know, sometimes people will usually just draw the lines, but I feel like creating those little gaps and that kind of like blurriness in the lines is a neat little trick to I would say it's it's definitely not perfect it's it's but it's a technique that I found that's pretty quick and easy to convey motion in like a slightly more convincing way than just just drawing lines um, and then also of course when you convey motion uh, it also depends on on the direction of where things are going right so for example like if you have a propeller of a wheel you're going to show that through the, the the trail or the track of 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 the uh, of the propeller also like a train passing by quickly you're gonna uh, draw it in perspective. It's the same kind of lines, but they're also kind of converging in one single point. So that's the first one with, with that. Um, readability uh, is another thing I think about a lot when I work on my comics. It's, it's a very simple thing, but one of the things that I do is um, between the background and the foreground, I might erase some of the lines along the very edges that help to kind of help the, help the character stand out a little bit more. You know, so for example, in this case I have a uh, uh, you know a dark character on a dark background, and uh, you know besides using highlights, it also helps to kind of help the character stand out by by kind of erasing those little areas. You can actually see some places in the wick where I forgot to remove it directly under the wick, and uh, you can see how it it kind of blends in a lot more. So it's a simple, tiny, tiny little thing, and most people probably don't notice it, but maybe subconsciously uh, it helps. I don't know. Um, other thing with readability is I think about of course high contrast. And uh, sometimes even uh, using high contrast, if it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it, it'll read better visually. So for example, uh, this is a character in my comic who is made entirely out of electricity. So she's made entirely out of light. Um, so she's not really gonna have a silhouette, right? She's not gonna have a shadow or, or a silhouette or a form like that, you know, because she's made of light. But for this case, it's a very simple thing that helps to, to bring the contrast out. So that's another thing to consider when thinking about readability, even if it's not necessarily realistic um you know you have in, in illustration and comics 
in line work, you have the ability to kind of break some rules for the sake of clarity. Um, and then also super important one, and one that I only recently really started learning more for is, is screen tone. So I don't know what program you guys might use. Some programs have it built in, uh, but in the case of Photoshop, Photoshop does have a few built-in screen tones, but there's also amazing resources online, like Silver Screen Tone as well. Um, and those are actually, if, if uh, it took me a while to realize that these options were even in Photoshop. So in the brush tool, you go to, you go to brush settings and uh, the textures allow you to, of course, you can do like stone, you can do different textures that relate to that, but uh, you also have like very simple screen tones as well, like diagonal lines and things like that. A lot of that I did actually use in my comics. So it's super useful, but it's super simple. Those are the kind of things that I implement in my comic. You can see an example here of using, to, of just using two of them in this case, but it's the, it's the dotted lines, uh, you know, to kind of convey shadows, but then also, um, you know, to, to, I, I like to use the, the diagonal or the straight lines to convey kind of light being cast down from a direction. Or in, the, in these cases, I use it a lot for bright light for contrast. Uh, that's another thing to consider as well, the screen tone. The other thing that's, that I think is really interesting for me in my case is because um, for the sake of printing and kind of keeping costs cheap, I wanted to uh, work on, on my comics to be uh, black and white. So, you know, there's a lot of limitations when thinking about grayscale and black and white. Um, and the hardest thing is how do you convey certain, certain visual effects, right? So, for example, I have the little drawing of the duck, of the rubber duck, uh, that it's easy to tell, you know, by the color uh, that it's in the water and the reflection. But sometimes when things are black and white, it's a little harder to differentiate. So you really have to kind of create a visual effects language. Of course, you have to be consistent within yourself, but then also, you know, by watching, you know, different illustrators and cartoons and things like that, it's helpful to kind of think of a visual language that a lot of people use. You know, so for water, you might use reflections, droplets, uh, very simple things that you use uh, to, to convey that. Uh, you also, for example, in the case of lightning, um, I might use, uh, for example, the character, the, the villain in this, in, in this one, the character on the left, I uh, use kind of extra filters that create a fuzziness and a noise filter around it. So it kind of creates a, a, this kind of static feeling to it. Um, and then also in the, in the center frame, you see the effect of the lighting, how sometimes even though the, the comic is a little more grayscale, to kind of show a, a high contrast in art in, in, in this lightning, I always make sure that when the lightning is around, that, um, that, that lines are, are drawing away from it. So for example, behind the character and near them, you can see the the lines always going away from it. And then of course the character on, on the right is how do you show the experience of being like electrocuted, right? So the character on the right, I also, uh, for her, I, I use, you know, the kind of breaking up of lines similar like I did with the, the motion lines, but because it's kind of all over, uh, it does that. And I also even use uh, the, 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 the box itself of the frame. I also kind of, kind of create some static even in the box itself and that helps Kind of convey and even to an extra step that that uh, that lightning a uh, fire when it comes to visual effects of course very simple one just you know making sure that you're using um, you know besides the smoke rising itself also using um, what's the word ashes uh, you know when it comes to smoke or or just kind of conveying an explosion the motion coming from every direction uh, just very simple things that but sometimes they make a big difference uh, this is kind of funny to 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 the, in a, a particular issue of my comic is that. Uh, one of the characters, uh, Green Mantis, she has uh, these arms that are translucent that are able to transform into anything. And they're kind of like a slime. I don't know what the right word is uh, to describe it. But uh, when it comes to that, you all, I also have to portray that in the drawing. So if you can see, for example, in the handshake that you can see through the hand, even though she's shaking the hand on the right side, you see as well the, uh, you know, like you can see the buildings through the hands as well. So there's a couple of different ways in which you can you can tell that. So uh, next up, uh, and, and I'm almost finishing up here, would be uh, outside the box thinking. It's, this is a very simple one, of course, when it comes to just, I guess, more comics in general than line work. But, um, you know, just simple things like using, you know, having the characters literally grab outside of the frame to show that they're kind of like panicking, they're trying to grab, or even just uh, instead of having to draw an entire speech bubble to just kind of have a blank space and have a little you know, a little line that goes from where the text is coming from, or to kind of create a little bit more, uh, kind of to draw the eye through the scene, like on the bottom right, to have literally the characters attack from one scene, go over to another one. And so those are simple things that 
kind of help lead the lead the eye through through what you're reading. Uh, the last thing is just um, that I that I use a lot in this comic is text as a character or, or using text in a way to convey more character. So, for example, the character on the left is a lot more rigid. She, she's a, a royal queen, so her 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 font is a little bit more like that. But then also, you know, she uses electricity. The character on the to the right of that is he's explosive. His language literally. So his his dialogue box is literally like a bomb and a wick. Um, you know, the character on top is made of, of steel and of uh, diamond. So that also kind of conveys that character on the right. Uh, she's got the like the slime, but she's also using a voice synthesizer. So the so the text is also the font is is um, you know kind of more robotic, literally. So little things like that make a big difference. Uh, final thoughts, uh, just more on the philosophical side. Just have fun with it. As you guys can tell, uh, you know, I try to have fun with the stuff that I make, you know, and also, of course, you got to really think about time, make time for friends, family, life, and health. That's super important, you know, because your best art comes from a mind at peace. You know, we really have to make sure that you're looking after yourself. Um, and more than that, of course, the biggest thing for me, I think, is that your worth as a human being is not dependent on your skill or volume of work, you know, just kind of do it for fun, you know, don't, don't take it so seriously. And, and it, it can be serious to you for sure, because it's important, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a form of therapy, a form of expression, but uh, you know, make sure that you don't let that uh, guilt of, oh, I'm not creating enough or I'm not making enough weigh you down, you know, I used to have that a lot, but, and the last one is, you know, every line you put down on paper is a gift to the world and to yourself. So don't feel obligated to create, you know, like I'm saying, just take it easy and, and have some fun with it. Some of us, you know, might make it a career, but some of us, it's just important to just make it for ourselves. And uh, with that, we're at the uh, end of the line. So that's uh, my, uh, my website. Uh, you can check out more of my work there. Uh, I have some social media on Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, that'll be it, yeah. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Isai. That was great. I love, like, there's uh, a lot of, yeah, like you said, like, there's clearly like a lot of fun in your work. And, and I love the, the focus on like clarity, making sure that like, the ideas that you're that you're conveying are like easy to read and yeah right thanks so much yeah, no problem. um so our, our next presenter is going to be mar julia you should be able to unmute hello yeah. <laughs> sorry i just forgot oh uh, i'm mar i'm gonna share my screen real quick i start There we go, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Mar, can everyone see everything? Okay, cool. Um, I, was born, I was raised in South Florida, but now I live in Providence. Um, my family's kind of scattered around Palm Beach County. Um, I came up here for school, I went to school in New York, and I just kind of stayed up here because I also have family up here. Um, but I am a freelancer, so I make comics for a living. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes my hands hurt, and I just want to take a nap. Um, <laughs> so this is just a couple of like examples of my work over the past like year or two. Um, some pages from Yellow Yellow Yellow, which was nominated for last year's Ignats, not this year's. Um, from some sample pages from my graphic novel that I'm working on with uh, Samuel Tier that Neil mentioned at the top. And then a couple of pages from Power Magic's Manana anthology, which just got kickstarted and funded and through all like a bunch of uh, stretch goals, including uh, a Spanish translation and like a hardcover uh, edition. So I'm really excited for everyone uh, in that to, to and to see it. It looks like it's going to be really good. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about my setup first. Oops. Um, so I use Photoshop. Uh, this is what a typical like page setup looks for me, looks like for me. Um, I use a Cintiq. I use a 13 inch Cintiq tablet. Uh, for anyone who's not like familiar with Wacom tablets, a Cintiq tablet is a tablet that has a screen in it that you can draw on, kind of like um, an iPad or something. And uh, the 13 inch is the smallest one. I chose it because I like the portability of it. Um, 
I can just, it's the same size as my laptop. I can put it in my backpack. And when I was able to travel, I could, you know, go and bring my work with me, which is really nice. But they make much bigger sizes, like 16 inches, 27 inches, 30 inches. And those are the ones you might see in like an animation studio. Um, I just don't need that much. This works for me pretty well. Um, they also make much cheaper uh, pen tablets, which is an active area where your screen is mapped to and you plug it in with the USB. So if you're really interested in starting to ink digitally and you don't want to sink, you know, hundreds of hundreds of dollars into a fancy tablet, you know, uh, Intuos or Bamboo used is perfectly fine. That's how I started um, when I was like a teenager. I bought a graphite Wacom tablet for like 70 bucks. Uh, yeah, I use Photoshop. Uh, it's like a monthly subscription these days, but if you would like just something that's a one-time buy, Clip Studio Paint is pretty much comparable to Photoshop, and a lot of my friends have actually switched to using it professionally. Um, and it's got pretty much all of the same features. I use Photoshop because I am stuck in my habits and I really like using it. Um, so as far as file setup goes, which is equally important when you're drawing uh, digitally for print. So like if you want to print what you're drawing, if you're drawing comics or something, um, you're making a zine or whatever, you should never work too small, like as far as uh, resolution goes. And so you never really want to size up your work. Um, I always try to work at, uh, like at size. Uh, some people work a little bigger. Um, and as far as like, you might hear it, DPI, pixels per inch, or resolution. Anything under 300 when you're printing can be iffy, depending on the size you're printing at. Um, especially like if you've ever printed out a JPEG you got on the internet off of Google and it came out like this big in the middle of a copy piece of paper, that's because it was 72 DPI. That's the basic DPI setting for like JPEGs on the internet. You don't want to draw anything at 72 DPI. It'll come out really small. So 300 minimum and 600 max is usually uh, what I use. I draw at 600 at the size that the page will be. And then I usually size down to three or 400 when I print. Um, and that's just like a good, easy kind of rule for when you're working. Um, so a lot of people tend to ask questions about brushes in Photoshop or Clip Studio Paint, which you can kind of port them between, I think. I tend to use two sets of brush tool presets. Um, the first one is from, is the Kyle Webster's drawing box or dry media sets. And I think these days they come with a Creative Cloud subscription or something. I've had them for a while, so I don't really know how that works. And then the other set is a set called uh, BRNK 2016. It is a set that uh, Andy Brinkman made. He is a background painter for at the, time, at the time I downloaded it was Titmouse, but I don't know if he works there anymore. He's a background painter in animation. Um, and I really like a lot of the uh, brushes in his pack. And I like using brush tool sets because it's easier for me. I have a shorthand for like a brush that I know that works. But at the same time, a brush is just a tool. Like it's not gonna fix everything that you're having issues with when you're drawing. So you can draw with like the standard hard round Photoshop like pen for all anyone cares. Um, which is like on the top. The one that I use the most is the Kyle Webster HB Pencil Pro. And then the bottom is just a different kind of dry media brush with less like opacity jitter on it. I use dry media, uh, like brushes that emulate dry media because I like the soft texture of them. I find inking brushes in digital formats tend to be really like hard looking um, for the way that I like my work to look. Um, and the Pencil Pro especially has uh, like really soft opacity jitter on it, which I like. Um, so you can tell the difference even between a different dry media brush that doesn't have that. And it's really just up to what you like and what you want your work to look like. Like this is the same exact drawing, but with two different brushes. Um, I did the top one in the brush I normally like to use and the bottom one with an ink brush from the BRNK set that uh, I sometimes will use if I'm coloring or putting in like a stiff shadow to something, but like I don't usually use when I'm drawing things. I like that soft opacity jitter and I like having uh, 
more control over the kinds of lines versus the like, this is an ink line kind of thing that you get with like brush presets in Photoshop. Um, and if you're someone who like wants to figure that kind of thing out, I would just say play around. It took me a while to figure out what I liked. I changed a lot until I found this one and I like it. Like don't tie yourself down, just kind of find something that fits you. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can literally be the standard hard round Photoshop brush. I know people who work with that. Like, uh, so if that's all you've got, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about my like attack pattern for best, <laughs> like lack of a better phrase, when I ink. And that is, I tend to work uh, in terms of important subjects first and then do less important things afterwards. So whatever the focal point of a panel or a page is, I tend to ink that first. So for instance, this page is from an anthology uh, from last year or the year before called Heartwood from Power and Magic Press. And the left side is just the ink page and the other side is the parts that are darker, the more opaque are what I went in first with. So like in a lot of comic pages, it's gonna be figures, uh, but maybe it's an establishing shot of like a city street. I will do the background, the buildings first, because it's easier to slot characters into that than change it afterwards if I drew the characters first, for instance. So I kind of go in order of importance for focal points and composition. So I'll do the characters and then maybe the big elements of the background and then fill in around those kinds of things. Um, because I don't know how many of you were here for the pencils panel, but my pencils philosophy is basically to do it as loose as possible and as vague as possible. And it's more about uh, setting up composition and putting things where I want them than getting a like pristine sketch I draw on top of. Um, I find that I lose energy in my drawings when I do that and I lose fun, honestly, when I ink on top of it. Um, and this is a very good example of how loose my sketches can be. Um, this is a page from Manana. And uh, the sketch layer is obviously extremely loose. I basically just blocked in the main elements of each panel, the figures, in this case, the Yamiya figure, and then the main character in the bottom three panels, uh, like especially her reflection in the window and like uh, where she's placed in her bedroom in the other two panels. And then when I'm inking, I will basically just like adjust from my shorthand in the pencils, like, oh, you know, I wanted a kind of frame of foliage but I didn't block out like exactly where or what shape the leaves were. I just do that in inking. Um, if I have a page that needs more reference and a better sketch, um, I'm notorious to my own self for drawing cars. It's just their shapes during penciling. Um, I refine the sketches as part of my inking process because it just fits better there in my brain. So there's no rules. Do what fits you best, basically. Uh, what else? Yeah, the other kind of like idiosyncrasy of my inking process is that I don't always decide on black fills during like the inking process, like when I'm inking. So on the left is like what I inked in initially. And then uh, on the right, I decided that I wanted the sky to be a black fill while I was toning. So I'll often wait till I'm coloring or toning a page to decide on certain spots of like bigger black fills because I want to see what the page will look like with the color or the tone on top of it. Um, I used to be a lot more uh, indecisive about it. So I would just do it as part of the inking process and then I'd get to toning or coloring and realize I didn't like it and I had to change it, which luckily for me in digital is really easy, which is like the upside of it. But I realized that if I just waited, I wouldn't have to change it. So I do black fill as a part of the next step of the process rather than necessarily, necessarily fitting it into my like inking. Because I tend to think of like penciling, inking, and coloring as not distinct steps. They're kind of just like building on top of each thing that you've made. Um, as, a, as opposed to like in the big two world, it's like a very separate kinds of things. So people, some people, when they start are like penciling is one thing, inking is another and coloring is another and they each have set points that you stop and end. And I think that's kind of 
rigid and you should find a workflow that, you know, fits with your unique, like, way of working in your brain and everyone thinks differently. So kind of meshing it in a weird way helps me actually work faster and streamline it easier because I don't have to change things. Uh, this is another example of that. So this is from Yellow Yellow. And then the left side is like the original inks. And then the right was when I was toning, I realized that I wanted more black space to push the figures forward because with all the tones and the crowds, they were getting lost. So I did a lot of black fill on like the back walls um, for this page. Uh, and this is the last thing I think I want to talk about as far as like technical things and like mixing phases of my work. Um, this is just a piece of fan art that I drew, but um, I will often when I'm coloring or toning my work, color the line art for my drawings. So I do this when I also do gray work. I will just do it in tones of gray rather than colors. Um, after I ink something, basically, when I'm coloring, or if, for instance, with like the thread that you see in the middle, I always knew I wanted it to be purple, so I just went in purple to begin with. Um, I will change the colors of the lines, like kind of as fitting the color palette that I'm working with. Um, and it's really easy to do in Photoshop. All you do is lock the transparency. It kind of looks like a little square like this with like the transparency cross hatches in it and it's in your layer settings and you lock it and you basically can only uh, draw on or paint on the lines that you've already put down. So you can just take a brush with like a yellow color and like paint all of the lines in this character's hair. And it's a really easy way to get that. Um, and I do that for pretty much everything. I tend to just do, as a general rule, that I often break, but a general rule, I usually do interior lines as colors that are either a little bit darker, or if it's kind of like, sorry, <laughs> uh, or if it's like luminous, maybe a little lighter uh, than the color that it's on top of. And to finish up, I have uh, a general list of some uh, people's work that I really like. Um, when I'm drawing, uh, I tend to keep books on my desk during different like points in the process, penciling, inking, coloring, um, of people's work that I really like. It's kind of like when I get stuck, I look at them, or maybe I have something that like I kind of want to do, but it's not working. So like I look at how other people do it, um, and that kind of like helps my brain process what I want more. So this is just kind of a smattering of people whose line work and drawings and ink I really like. Um, it's by no means a comprehensive list or in any kind of order. <laughs> um, it's a mix of indie cartoonists um, and uh, manga artists and illustrators and a couple of my friends that I love. <laughs> um, and they're all really, really great. Um, Freddie Crasco, whose name I dropped an R in, I realized. Um, his book Gleam is also up for an SPX, uh, name that's a word this year. It is my favorite book that's come out in the last year. His ink work is spectacular. And if you're looking for a book to get inspired by drawings wise, pick up Gleam from Piao. It's really, really good. Um, and of course, everyone on this list is absolutely great. Um, Daisuke Igarashi did Children of the Sea, which is on Netflix if you wanted to watch it. It's one of my favorite series. Um, Tatsuro Kiyuchi is a illustrator from Japan. Tyra Matsumoto, of course, did Tech on Concrete and uh, Black and White, which is Black and White, and uh, Sunny and Ping Pong and Go Go Monster. His work is amazing and really, really lovely. Uh, Rosemary Valero O'Connell, like hot uh, comics protege, uh, did Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me recently. Um, Kelly Kay is another illustrator, kind of straddles the comics line. Uh, she had an issue that came out with Frontier that is really cool. She does a lot of really soft graphite ink work, which I really like. It has this fuzzy quality that's really great. Uh, Gima Gariba is illustrator, animator, kind of saddles the line and does a lot of amazing character drawings and really simple ink work, which is really nice. Uh, Jin Tamaki is a very, very big illustrator and comics artist. Her books are great, like this one, Summer. Uh, Helen Joe is another illustrator who does lots of ink work. Uh, Richie Pope also does both, but he works in animation now. His books are really simple, really clean, and really, really nice. Um, Kevin Chap, uh, you can get four years from Radiator. Um, 
they uh, are my friend and I love their ink work. It's very soft and organic and it's really, really pleasing to read and to look at. Ire Aki is another manga artist. Um, she did Ran in the Gray World, which is just super dense and super flowy and it's not hard to read despite either of those things and it's really, really amazing. Um, Chu is uh, an alias for an artist that does uh, a lot of different things, mostly an illustrator, but their ink work is very clean and precise and they don't have any like frills in the way of the things that they draw with, but their drawings are incredibly intense and uh, detailed and really, really nice. And then Casey Nowak is another comics artist who I really like. I kept their book, Diana's Electric Tongue, on my desk while I was drawing Yo Yo Yo. Um, and it was really inspiring for me during that process. And I think... That is it. Yes, that is it. Um, so that's kind of my process and my thought process while I'm inking. And um, it was kind of macro versus like the micro uh, that was presented before me. But uh, I kind of wanted to present it in a like neat package. So yeah. Cool. That was great, Mar. Um, I really love the like. There was a ton of really great like detail on tools, um, and then also like a lot of really great detail on like specifications on like yeah exactly how you tune things. I've always get people who are new to digital inking asking questions about tools and like what brushes do you use? I want to use this. Like, do I need Photoshop? And it's like not really. Just play around. <laughs> so it felt like it was like necessary info. Cool. Yeah. And I just uh, pasted in the chat both some of the, the brushes and then also the anthology from Power and Magic Press. Um, so thanks again, Mar. Um, our next presenter is Karina Vo. Hi. Um, let me share my screen. Can everyone see this? Cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Karina. This is how I spell it online. It's like a username I came up with in like 10th grade and then it just like kind of stuck even before I started posting art. I started posting art in like 2016, but I've been drawing my entire life. And just like, I started mostly posting like pen and ink drawings. Um, this is actually from October two years ago, I think, but um. Yeah, I just wanted to start off with my ink drawings because that's where I just started in general. And this style has pretty much stayed with me. Like I kind of came full circle because when I first got Photoshop, I was really into like doing lineless work because it was something that I didn't really have like, I guess like the patience to do traditionally. Um, and like, I kind of just went wild with like color and like not super wild with textures, but um, I was playing with textures a lot as well. Um, yeah, and I was like really inspired by like editorial illustration because I studied journalism like in high school and then in college I did like digital media, which is like pretty similar to journalism. But like I've always drawn my entire life and like in like I think I made like a comic that was basically Sonic the Hedgehog like in fifth grade and like I've just always been really into like um, just drawing and but I didn't really think that it was like something I could like actually pursue which is you know unfortunate because it did get in the way of like choosing what I wanted to study but at the end of the day like here I am um so yeah but then I kind of came full circle in terms of like going back to line work um just like as I like continued to draw and just like watched you know like more anime and, and manga and really understood like what I liked um, and just like started following more artists online. Like, um, yeah, I just started to really understand what I like and actually Chu that uh, Mar mentioned, um, they are extremely like influential to me because I had like a lot of um, indecision when it came to brushes. Like, do I want like something that looks like pencils? Do I want something that looks like really like beautifully rendered and painted and stuff. And so it was like really hard for me to decide on that because of course there's like great art in every style. But um, yeah, like coming across like Chu's work was, was like 
really like big for me because um, they're able to accomplish like really like striking like emotional work um, that is pretty much simple if you like break it down into like you know like brush and shading and, and whatnot and also um, pretty much anything Masaki Yuasa directs like Tatami Galaxy and like Night of Sword Walk On Girl like the style is always just like line work and like flat color and I think that's just like I, I really admire like being able to make something cool in a very like simple style. Um, so that's just something I really admire. And uh, yeah, but I mean, I do, I do color sometimes. So this is what my work looks like, but it's not lineless. I do like to maintain line work even in my colored work now. Um, yeah, and this is actually the most recent thing that I drew. Um, again, like super line work focused. And this is like, I did like um, three different drawings that two of which you'll see later. Um, this is like almost in preparation for Inktober, I guess, because I, I don't like color during Inktober. But um, yeah, just like, yeah. Um, I guess to like pick this apart a bit, uh, one of the the things I have the most fun with is inking hair um, because it, it is like just really dynamic. It can be really um, just like interesting and fun. Um, so I take a pretty like simple and like just flat approach to hair. Um, but like my hair tends to be really frizzy. So I, lo I love to draw like flyaways and just like convey texture and um, yeah, like, like it can be done without having to like render every strand, which is something that was like kind of life changing for me to figure out when I finally figured it out on my own. Um, yeah, and so what I use, I actually use an iPad that I got through like my full time job. Um, so very fortunate for that. Um, and I use Procreate. Uh, so yeah, I went from like traditional to Photoshop when I got my first like laptop tablet. Um, it was one of those that like was a laptop and then like flipped into a tablet and it wasn't really the best. So there were some like hardware issues that like were really frustrating. Um, but like Procreate has been really like intuitive, like really straightforward, like Apple products are great. It took me a while to like be like, yeah, okay, like I'll give in and I'll just like go for it. Um, but yeah, so those are my tools as of right now. Um, and just a bit about brush settings. Like I said, like I've always like had trouble deciding like what kind of line work I want to do. But um, every time I did Inktober, especially traditionally, I would like uh, just really like what my micron pen drawings look like. Um, I have them right here. So like the micron pen is just like, just like a super simple, like fine point pen, if you guys can see. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just really liked, uh, the qualities of that. And so, um, basically I take like the default technical pen, um, in Procreate. And so I knew that I wanted something monoline, something that wasn't super like pressure sensitive, like a brush pen. Um, and I wanted something with like, like rounded tips rather than something that tapered off into a fine point. Um, so these are all things you can change in like the Procreate Brush Studio. So the, um, I was a bit frustrated at first because I didn't realize that like some of the settings had to be changed under the Apple Pencil tab, which is like towards the bottom. Um, so yeah, so I changed the pressure size, which is the pressure sensitivity down to 20%. Um, I think default, it is like 50 and the technical pen, like by itself, like without changing any settings is not super pressure sensitive, which is why I kind of grad gravitated towards it. Um, but yeah, so, and then I also I actually left the flow on. I tried turning it off because like a micron pen, like when you're drawing tra traditionally, like it doesn't really have flow where it, um, I guess gets this like wet quality at the end of it. 
Um, but flow does help a lot with just like continuing line work when you're drawing because it makes the um, tips like a bit opaque, um, um, excuse me, not opaque, transparent, a bit transparent. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a lot easier to continue line work cleanly rather than trying to connect like two like super hard points. Um, so yeah. And uh, my sketches are, are very like this. Um, I, I do think that if I did a lot of like a lot more comic work, um, I would be, I, I would probably be more detailed just because it would get pretty messy. Um, but yeah, probably the most important thing that I do when I'm sketching is separating it into layers and different colors, just to like fully understand what's going on. Um, it just like helps my brain pick things apart. So the hand and the shadow and the face are on three are on their own separate layers. And that also helps with just like moving stuff around and also like when I'm inking like the hand, for example, I will hide the other two layers. Um, just because like sometimes I just need to look at the one thing that I'm inking. Um, and that just helps me a lot. Um, yeah. And again, here's like the sketch that looks like I drew it with my fist. Um, this is actually Mob Psycho fan art. And um, so from, from one step to the next, it's a bit like there's a lot that happens. Um, so all of like my detailing, my shading, my facial expressions usually come um, when I am actually inking. And I think that's largely because I have a pretty simple style. Um, but yeah, I also like to give myself a bit of like, I guess like mental room to be able to like take a bit of liberty with like, um, I guess just like detailing when I'm, when I'm lining. Um, because actually when I first started drawing, I did not sketch. I just kind of like put pen to paper and I, I think that's just like how my brain works now. Um, so yeah, and just, I guess a bit about like my shading style. Um, I started using like, just like flat black shading. Um, and it works really well when I'm doing just like black and white drawings, um, but it is very, very stark. And so I try to use it pretty sparingly. Um, I don't really use it on like faces or anything because unless there's like, you know, like really dramatic lighting. And sometimes I do play with like screen tones as well. This is actually, the screen tone brush is something I found just by Googling like free half tone brushes. And it gave me like this like really nice like pack of like 20 or so screen tones um, that, you know, like are a bit like pretty, a bit imperfect, which is like, I guess what I go for. Um, so yeah. But yeah, just like, I guess like my general philosophy is just like, things can change from like start to finish. I used to be really like, like hyper fixated on like visualizing something before I even touched a paper um, and just like making sure it came out exactly as I thought in my mind initially. Um, and I think that was probably because I was drawing traditionally and I just didn't want to waste paper or ink. Um, but when I, when I started drawing digitally, like I realized like that's not the case. Like I can, you know, just erase, even if it's like an ink line, I can erase or I can like adjust a composition. I can adjust size. Like I can completely just like do a 180 from what I initially wanted to do. And, and a lot of the times too, like my sketches aren't so much to like um, get a clear idea of the final product. It's more about just like blocking out like the composition and form. Um, and even then, like when I am inking, a lot of things can change from there. So yeah. And just like a, like a little like time lapse of just like show you, like I tried one pose and then I didn't like it. And I'm constantly like hiding things, rotating things. Um, just, I could not decide on an outfit 
for this character, like, it's just constantly changing. Um, so it's just really helpful to, I guess, like, tell myself that, um, because I used to get really frustrated about that, but, um, yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, um, thank you for being here and putting this together. Great. Thanks so much, Karina. That, I am such a sucker for screen laps drawings. Like I love seeing the way people draw. So that was very exciting. Um, yeah, they're, they're very calming to me. I, I have them on a lot when I'm drawing as well. Oh, whoa, cool. Yeah. So you actually, yeah. you watch uh, the way other people draw like while you're drawing or you're just like you on in the background and they always tend to have like really calming music as well. So it's just like kind of like a double like like a win-win so nice. that was yeah. great um yeah thanks thanks so much for sharing your your tools and your settings and and then also your process and all of those great drawings um so our final presenter for the evening is diego infante and i'll hand the presentation over to diego Um, can you hear me or? Cool. So I just want to say like all three of your like presentations, like your work is beautiful. Like that was just amazing. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Neil, can you um, actually like tell me through like voice so that I can make sure that you can hear me? Um, mm -hmm. All right, so. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. So can you see the uh, screen? Yes. Cool. All right. So I'm um, Diego, and this is basically like my process of digital inking. Um, it's been mostly like trial and error. I have like been doing this like without really like knowing how you're supposed to do it, but um, I find that some things work and some things don't. So, yeah. So basically, um, this is Draggy. He is the mascot for Eight Sider Comics, and he crash landed in Miami, and he loves him about us. Basically, um, he doesn't really speak, so he communicates through his expressions and everything. And um, the main thing about that is so that people can understand him, uh, no matter where they're from or what language they speak. And that's why I think that um, he's like the perfect mascot for eight-sided comics. Um, I think that, um, hold on, let me just put it in time. All right. Um, hey, I think comics are for everybody and they should be like appreciated by anybody, no matter like who they are, where they're from. So, sorry. All right. Uh, this is Scorpia and Scorpia is another character. Um, she basically, uh, is the protagonist of um, multiple of my series, um, mainly um, Scorpion and the Smiling Freaks, which was my first graphic novel. I um, originally made this like two different times and one time like the files got deleted and my computer like got messed up. So I had to like restart it, which was cool because then I like changed it up and I made it even better than before. So um I was really uh, happy with how this came out. And now looking back to it, it's like, just not really like what, um, what I make now. So um, basically it's like a revenge story. It's an homage to Spaghetti Westerns. It's an homage to punk rock. And the main story, it's kind of just um, this girl in a punk band and she gets kidnapped by uh, these circus freaks with her friends. Um, and then it's it's a revenge story. So, um, and then the new one that I'm working on is Los Pesados. It's a prequel, um, and it basically explores this um, uh, band as they're growing up and kind of just like the awkward moments of that. So, Scorpion the Smiling Freaks is for mature audiences because it has so much blood and it has gore and all that stuff. Um, I really enjoy drawing that, and yeah. 
And then I have uh, the Children of Argus series, which is kind of like a space fantasy saga. Um, it's a single issue um, series. So I tell like one chapter, another chapter, another chapter. And it's basically three children who um, find each other in this planet. And these invaders kind of came over and they're taking the resources from the land. They're um, basically destroying tribes, killing animals, and just have like no respect for this world. And it's kind of familiar to like real life, but um, I kind of want to like tell this, um, kind of give this message to like kids so that they can kind of appreciate the planet that they're living in. And yeah. So basically my comic process is kind of like simple. This is um, something that I find that works for me. Um, so I plan it out, you know, I brainstorm it. Um, this is all part of the writing process. Um, I come up with a story and then a vague um, amount of dialogue. I don't really know exactly what they're going to be saying at the end. I usually like change things around a lot. So I just have like a somewhat of an idea of what I'm going to be saying at the beginning. And then I do like rough sketches, kind of just like putting like different characters in different places, make sure that it all fits, make sure that I can tell the story within um, the specific amount of pages that I'm using and the amount of panels so that the pacing is like good. So um, then I do pencils and I like kind of just like clean it up a little bit. Um, I make sure that it's, uh, the proportions are good. Um, I want to make sure that like everything kind of just fits on the page on the page nicely. Uh, then the inking process, which is kind of like the most important process of the book. You know, I feel like the inking is kind of like the final part of the book, um, like the color and the effects and all that stuff. Like, yeah, it's important, but it's kind of extra to the inking. I feel that the um, the inking. It's kind of like, it's just like what the final book is. You know, if the inking is done right, then it's gonna be a good looking book. If the inking is not done right, you can't really kind of hide it with the, uh, with the color. So um, the first part of the process of inking for me is kind of just like prepare for the inking. I wanna make sure that the pencils are like all properly, um, kind of set up I want to make sure that there's balance in the um, in the image I want to make sure that the proportions are all correct it makes sense to the eye and I feel that it's easier to fix any problems that you may have now because once you start inking and then you find a mistake it's really a pain to have to go back and erase certain things um, then I kind of just like experiment with different brushes I um I kind of develop different um line variation depending on like which brushes I use and everything. Sometimes it's like it looks more tribal, sometimes it's more futuristic. So it all depends on um what I'm drawing and then the brushes kind of like lend to that. Um I use a lot of um stock brushes and then I download like so many different brushes and I kind of like lose track of how many I have. So it's kind of like I have like a whole list of different brushes and I don't even know which one I'm using. Um, but basically this is kind of like the coloring book stage because uh, pretty much like at this point you can kind of print it out and then color it and it's like a coloring book or um, you can just like add different layers and just like color onto it. Um, keep your lines precise and refined. Uh, I feel that undoing is one of the best things because you can kind of draw the same thing over and over again and you're like really not thinking about it but what you're doing is muscle memory and it's really helping you like get better lines without even realizing it so um i always do like um i try to like get the background with uh very like light lines and then the foreground with um uh, thicker lines because um, I find that that just makes it pop more. Um, I really want the foreground to stand out. Um, and that's something that I've been doing. And one thing is that if it doesn't really like, if the drawing doesn't look good at this point, 
adding colors and shading isn't going to fix it. Um, you know, like it's not something that you can kind of like disguise within what you have. You have to like really make sure that it's done right so that it looks really, really like well at the very end. Um, and then I tend to like do the shading after. Um, I have the shading like as um, a separate layer usually because I mess up a lot. But um, I, I have like multiple ways of shading. I do like um, different layers. Um, I kind of add on to them. And I just like do like five layers of shading and then I erase them until like, like I do more layers until it looks bad and then I erase those. So it's, it's kind of just like experimenting with what looks good and what doesn't. And that's kind of like my whole philosophy, like kind of like if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, try again. So um, yeah, you can um, add on to the, you can also add on to the, um, the drawing with like heavy black lines. And that's kind of a more dramatic look, but if it's done right, I feel like it's very strong. Um, it does take more time and more practice um, because of the fact that you have to kind of like know how the muscles work. You have to know how like the clothing kind of just like carries on to the um, um, character and everything. So yeah. Um, Basically, I have like three different methods of inking. There's light inking, which is like simple, cute um, characters. You want to make sure that the character is like, um, you can see the shape of it and it works. And then you can also like do like medium, which is like adding a little bit more um, shading to it. Um, and it just gives it much more of another like dimension to it. And then heavy is just like, adding on to it, kind of just like playing around with how much you can really like add. And, you know, sometimes it works. And when it does, it's, I think it works pretty good. So the books that I'm working on right now are Children of Argus 3, Planes of Confusion. This one is going to be kind of uh, the game kind of like going against Joy Joe, which is like the new villain. Um, it's going to be pretty, pretty fun to do. I've already done like the whole um, like page layout and everything. And then Los Pesados, I mean, this is like, it's like punk rock, like Mexico. Like it's it's just the, the most awkward part of growing up. I wanna put in like the moments that I cringe at um, because it's just, it's really fun to do that. So yeah, thank you. Um, Basically, if you want to see my art and stuff, you can check out my website or Instagram at 8sided. And I also have a 8sided comics Instagram, which is kind of like more about the comics themselves. So, yeah. That's, um, that's, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Diego. I, it was really interesting to get like your philosophy on like, uh, you know, like the importance of inking and then also yeah. sort of like your, your, your thoughts about like changing your techniques based on like the, the mood or like, you know, yeah, like the tone that you're right. trying, to, trying to go with. Um, oh, I so also have, because one of the main things about like my books is that I really love traditional like physical books. So I always like print out like traditional like physical books. Um, I just prefer it more to digital. That's just personal preference. Um, but this is kind of like Scorpion, like, and it's just, I love like feeling the pages and everything. I don't know. It's, it's just fun. For sure. Yeah. I, I hear you on the, enjoying the, the, the tactile, like finished product. Um, so we are, I, I just wanted to check in with, with the panelists. We are at an hour. Um, so, but I wanted to see, are, are you cool with a few questions? Is that okay? okay. Um, so we did get a question during, Mar, during your presentation, mm -hmm. um, asking you if you could expand a little bit on, on 
the idea that you had about um, jitter? Oh, um, it's basically Photoshop lingo for a certain setting. Um, so like what Karina was talking about in uh, Procreate, where you kind of saw her slider bars on the flow and the pen pressure, um, Photoshop calls that jitter. So if you go into brush settings, you can uh, change the like opacity jitter or like there's like color hue jitter. You could literally make a brush that like changes, like jitters the colors up and down as you like stroke it. Um, that is just what Photoshop tends to call it. It really just means setting opacity to pen pressure so that when there's less pressure, it's light. And then um, whatever full pressure on your settings is, is when it's like full opacity. Um, so we have a, a question from Kaija asking, does anyone have opinions on stabilization? Which I don't know what that means. Um, is, that, is that a term in? Sort of. Legal inking? Um, it's a little vague uh, for the pen setting. Okay, yeah. Um, so I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> there's like mm. a little there's a box in photoshop kind of that's like smoothing um yeah, smoothing. and that's what i think of when i think of stabilization um when i mean it's vague it's kind of like people have different ideas of what they mean when they say stabilization um i turn smoothing off i don't like it um, yeah it, it depends on like how good your computer or your, or your your you know whatever you're drawing on is but usually for me like there's always a delay of like where my pen is and, and i'm so used to like you know like physical drawing that it's just any little like lag is just completely throws me off. Yeah, smoothing and stabilization things cause insane lag on my computer. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is, if you're having trouble with like straight lines or not straight lines, but like smooth lines, it's like you're trying to like draw a curve and you want it smooth. Um, honestly, what uh, Diego was saying about just undo and redraw it, I do that all the time. Yeah. Like, I'll draw the same thing a million times until I get like the, the curve right. And it's a very quick thing. Like I have um, a numlock keyboard with all my hotkeys on it. Um, and it's USB into my computer and it's got like all the hotkeys for Photoshop on it. So I'll just like press control Z and like do it and like do five lines in 30 seconds and I'll like one. That's awesome. It's super easy. Um, so do you, I mean, is there the risk of, of running into the, like an undo void where you just like trapped in like a vortex of. I guess if you're a extreme perfectionist, maybe, um, my philosophy on it is, um, if you just can't, if you draw something and you want to change it and you're afraid you can't, or you're afraid you'll get into that, it's like, you do it once, you'll do it again. It's like Diego said, muscle yeah. memory. Like it's just practice. It's a skill. You did it once. You can do it again. It might take a while, but you can do it again. And sometimes you just have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like um, I'm like I'm literally the undo button. Like I've had it. Like there's literally you can't see it through oh, here my, on my Cintiq. There's like literally like a mark exactly on the on the hot key that I have the undo on. So it's it's true. I mean, it, it's funny, right? Because I, I also feel like there's a need to discipline yourself doing it too much you know like it can be right. a bit of a crutch like sometimes the line was good the second or the third time but hey another 10 you know so anybody that has OCD I think you really got to temper it for sure I yeah and sometimes really, go ahead um, um okay uh sometimes like when I'm sketching like I actually like how the line turns out better than when I actually ink it um I do use in procreate it's called um streamlining and a lot of people like really like the streamlining in Procreate because it doesn't do that like delay thing that a Photoshop does with smoothing. But I still do not like to use it because I feel like I tend to lose like a lot of like character and like life when it comes to like um, lining. But like I draw a lot of hands like which was clear in my presentation and sometimes just like, mm. like a long straight part of a finger is like really frustrating and I'll just like give up and be like, okay, I'm gonna streamline this and like, like just go for it. But um, in general, like when I'm drawing like small details or like faces, like I definitely do not uh, use that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely like practice. It's definitely character and lines. Like when you like, 
like the natural way of you drawing a line it there's so much of your character in there i feel um uh, i think that it's mainly a problem when like you switch back to traditional and you're so used to like undoing so like you have to like erase it and and if you can't erase it it's like i mean inking uh digitally is just it's so like convenient that like traditional is just like uh there's so much that you can mess up on and it's harder to just go back sure yeah i guess i did a lot of uh traditional work and like less digital or less like serious digital work when i was younger and one thing i used to do which might help someone with trouble with this and connects to that is like i used to do what Trina did and just draw my sketchbook in straight ink or something that I couldn't erase and like they weren't good drawings or precious drawings but it was like to get used to not being able to change something or to kind of like train yeah. my hand yeah that, that's exactly when I started improving a lot it's like I yeah. used to just really use like a pencil as a crutch and just go really soft on the lines and I started using like a ballpoint pen just the, the cruddiest one you can find but it's just like it was I had to commit to the lines like it was yeah. so helpful Sure. you're forced to fix it really yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, we have another question um, that's uh, do you design a character or scene first and write the story around it or do you always write first that's probably story for me at least I kind of do uh, it all simultaneously sometimes <laughs> um, so I usually get an idea for something first and sometimes that's characters and sometimes that's I want to make a something like this and then I usually flesh out the characters and design them in the same time frame as like fleshing out what I want to happen and sometimes a scene just pops into your head and you're like oh I want this scene somewhere when I'm writing something longer I um, use Scrivener which is a writing program that allows you to kind of put like index cards almost in a line and sometimes I just have like a folder full of scenes I want, but I don't know where or what tap, like I don't know where they're fitting yet. So sometimes I do that and sometimes I don't use them, but I kind of do it all in a chaotic little ball. I mean, I feel like um, for me, I like when I draw a character out, um, sometimes I do the character first, sometimes I do the story first, but my characters go through so many changes that like i'll draw him like one time um before like the story and then i write the story and it's like i add so many different like um uh things about like the character like um, where they're from and everything and i include that into the actual design and then i change the designs quite a lot so it's it's constantly like changing um and it's always fun to, to draw your characters in like different clothing and different hairstyles um, because it just helps you like kind of diversify it. Uh, Karina, did you want to add anything? Um, well, I mean, since I don't do a lot of like uh, story work, uh, I, the times that I have, I have kind of just done the story first and then characters. Um, but as far as like when I'm doing like a standalone illustration, I kind of just like come up with it as I'm inking. Uh, one thing I do do when it comes to like character design, I just try to look back at the last character that I drew and make sure that they look um, different in some way. I want to make sure that I'm not like drawing like the same design over and over because um, my style is very simple. So a lot of like my faces tend to look the same, which is definitely something that I need to work on. Um, but as far as just like the overall character, like I definitely uh, do try to be like as inclusive as possible and just be, you know, like diverse in like every way. Um, and so now we have another question, which might be the, the last question that we do for tonight. Um, and that's from, from Meg asking, I work in comics and I want to ask why they require some comics to be in 600 DPI. I find it hard to do the higher DPI. Um, it's a printing specs thing. Um, I guess it would help uh, 
in advice to give you if uh, I knew a little bit more about why you find it hard to work in the higher DPI, if it's just like live on your computer or uh, if it's like a like working on it kind of thing. But it's definitely a printing specs thing with the higher DPI, it's more pixels per inch. So it's more detail and you can get a smoother, crisper image versus a lower DPI. Um, oftentimes they'll size it down a bit to four or 300 before printing, but it's the bigger DPI makes the file a bit bigger. So you can work at size, but it'll be a little bit bigger in reality. Um, so it shrinks down just a little bit. I'd say another small tip, because um, I, I know a couple of people that, I mean, it obviously depends on like the style of art and what you're working on, but I know some people that even use like Illustrator or different like vector programs to, to do their art. So that kind of solves some of that issue. Like you can work on like a smaller scale, something that you feel more comfortable with. And then if you need to scale up later on, you're able to, you have still all that control when it comes to printing it at 600 at 1200, you can make it a billboard, you know, size. It, it, it's, yeah. So I know some people that do that because of the versatility of it. Yeah, it's definitely easier to size up vector things. Um, working on it is harder to draw. Okay, um, I guess it's like, it might help to think of it as like, the higher DPI does make the file size a little bit bigger. So if you're drawing at something that's 300 DPI versus something that's 600 DPI, like if you open two files that are the same size at the different DPIs, you might notice that like, if they look the same size, they're at different zoom outs when you do them because the, deep, the extra pixels do make it a little bit bigger. Um, so adjusting like, you know, your brush size or how you're drawing might help you a bit um, in getting used to it. Uh, I like it, especially when I'm drawing mini comics, I still work that big, even if I'm not giving it to like a publisher, because if I'm drawing something at like five and a half by eight, um, the 600 DPI gives me extra space and I don't have to draw with a super tiny brush or be like super careful with my details. If that helps, I hope that helps. Yeah, I, I work at 300 just because my laptop's not like the strongest, but like you yeah, said, it's kind of like the minimum of it, yeah. Yeah, 400 might be a good middle point for you then, Meg. Yeah. Because uh, 400 is usually like, uh, some smaller publishing will have like, publishing has different guidelines for everything, but some people will be like ink at six and color at four. So 400 might be a good middle place and no one will know you didn't draw at six. Sweet. Cool. Well, um, I think that's, that's a great place to, to, to wrap things up. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, uh, so um, first of all, Thank you so much to um, Diego and Mar and Isai and Karina, um, all for your wonderful presentations. I am um, pasting links to their web presence in the um, chat. Um, so um, please definitely like check them out and and. Uh, I know several of them have comics for sale on their website. So um, if you've got some, some extra funds, um, support them that way. Um, so, oh, whoops, this is out of order. Um, so if you aren't doing anything uh, next week, we'll be having another nuts and bolts um, session. Next week's subject is physical inking with Eric Bonham, Ana Inahosa, Jairo Lantigua, and Drew Lerman. They'll be getting their hands dirty and talking about using pens and brushes to move ink on paper. Um, so another great tie-in to Inktober. Um, and also every Friday, we host a drop-in open studio work session from 4 to 6 p.m. for you to work on your comics. Um, it's broken up into four 20-minute work sessions. Um, so they're quiet work sessions. Everybody works on their comics and then there's a 10 minute break in between each of the work sessions where you can stretch your legs and drink some water and socialize. Um, it's a lot of fun and it's um, some time that you can set aside to get some work done. Um, you can learn about those programs at uh, radiatorcomics.com slash studio. Um, this weekend, um, I'm gonna be enjoying some uh, virtual programming that I would highly recommend to you. Um, SoulCon, uh, the Black and Brown Comics Festival, 
hosted by Ohio State University's Office of Diversity and Inclusion is happening on the 10th and the, through the 12th. Um, also, the Small Press Expo has a slate of programming on September 12th and 13th. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I encourage you to check out that stuff. I've included the, the links there. Um, we are planning more programming uh, here um, go, moving forward. Um, in fact, we just confirmed an event for February of 2021 today. Um, so keep an eye out on our social media and, and stuff like that. Um, we always want to hear from you um, if you have programming suggestions or proposals or just want to say hi. My email address is neil at radiatorcomics.com. That's N-E-I-L at radiatorcomics.com. Um, so that's it. Thank you so much to uh, Diego and Tamar and Isai and Karina for your wonderful presentations tonight. And thank you everybody for joining in. Um, I hope you have a great week and stay safe. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great thank night. You. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>